and share that. There we go. So, Mike, can you see that? Or are you moving? So it's a pleasure to be able to uh, participate in this uh, great opportunity or this great event, uh, this 24 hour around the world uh, se uh, seminar and webinar. And uh, the next uh, presentation or the presentation I'm gonna be giving is I'm looking at the Northeast Pacific in particular, but very generally, I'm also gonna to touch on some of the role the ocean plays in the ocean and why we would be wanting to pay attention to a phenomenon in the ocean when we're considering climate change. So the title is Marine Heat Waves in the Northeast Pacific, and I'm gonna have a subtitle of the blog and links to climate change. Can I not advance? The keyboard is not advancing. So this is a very brief out outline for the presentation. Uh, and I'm gonna start by sort of uh, giving us some broad background of the role the ocean plays in moderating climate. Uh, we've had many presentations today hitting on uh, all aspects of this and uh, perhaps even hint at what we were expecting climate change might look like. And this is a little retrospective. If I was asked maybe even 30 years ago, how might climate change show up or what would I be looking for and I may be looking for a gradual warming or a gradual shifting in patterns. And I think I'm gonna convince you today that maybe that is not how climate change is showing up. Uh, in particular, uh, I wanna draw attention to a phenomenon that happened in the Northeast Pacific uh, between 2013 and 2015. It was uh, very sudden in some sense, it was abrupt, uh, and it was a very major significant event in the Northeast Pacific. Uh, I'd like to close by then looking at what's happening now in the Northeast Pacific, and maybe we're having a repeat heat wave that's developing out there right now. So I will show you some very recent data. And then I close by again having this idea that maybe we do need to think about how climate change is going to show up uh, locally, regionally, and maybe even globally. So jumping to the, uh, the punchline, this is uh, a warm temperature anomaly in the Northeast Pacific. It is the difference from the <clears throat> a three month average from December to February of 2014, 2013 to 2014, subtracted from the 30 year average from 1981 to 2010. And what remains is a very large distinguishing pattern, <clears throat> which Nick Bond at the University of Washington, a climatologist there, when he was asked, what does this look like? He referred to it as the blob and this, uh, code word actually stuck for a very long time. So we've been locally referring to this as the blob. It looks like a large patch of warm water. And to give you a scale here, this is approximately over an area of the ocean of about a million square kilometers. It had temperature deviations as high as three degrees at the surface. And most of this data that we're seeing here is coming from satellite uh, analysis which is able to cover a large portion of the ocean and uh, allow us to put together a long-term mean. And then look at the deviations, which is the temperature anomaly. <clears throat> Just also to punch, uh, jump to the punchline and give you a hint of what's coming up. This is what's happening out there right now. It did wane in 2018, uh, but it looks like these very warm patterns are coming back now in 2019. So I'm gonna come back to this at the end, that this is perhaps how climate change is gonna show up, a major change in how our regional systems behave. So this is a, a, just a satellite image showing the planet. And what I want to highlight here is that the ocean really is a very dominant feature of our planet. It covers over 70% of the planet, land only 30%. About 10% of the planet is covered by ice, and this is on land and over the ocean in the Arctic where we have sea ice. About 60 to 70% of the planet is covered by clouds, so this is not unrepresentative, this satellite image showing that a lot of the surface, if you're looking from space, is cloud. And that has a little bit of a consequence because that reflects light back out into space. But I want to emphasize the fact that the ocean is a, has a very moderating effect on our climate. And people that live along the coast know this very much. Uh, as, so if you live near the coast, you know how your climate is affected by the ocean. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a highlight of some of the atmospheric circulations and where you on the planet live is dictated by these large scale wind patterns. <clears throat> and in this cartoon, we see we have the trade winds here converging along the equator and we have a higher uh, winds, the westerlies. 
So I live here on the west coast of Canada, and this is the predominant wind pattern we have on the west coast of Canada. It is a prevailing wind from offshore to onshore, which means it brings wet weather with it. So we have a wet climate along the coast of North America here. In contrast, where you have trade winds, for example, these southeast trade winds south of the equator, they're offshore winds. So along this coastline, you have a very dry climate, even though it too is along the coast. So where you are on the coast dictates very much on what your climate is like. Perhaps not so much in temperature, but certainly in the rainfall you would expect. Along the equator, the intertropical convergence zone, which is the uh, region between the Hadley cells there, it migrates north and south with the sun. And so if you live in India, you know the consequence of onshore and offshore winds because it gives you a mo wet monsoon season when the intertropical convergence zone is to the north and the trade winds effectively blow from off the ocean onto land and you get the wet monsoon season. And then when the sun shifts to the southern hemisphere, the trade winds shift over and they blow offshore and you get the dry monsoon season. So we in coastal environments and even in continental places are greatly affected by the ocean and the wind patterns that either blow to from the ocean or onto the ocean. Here's a, a sort of a, a, a simple cartoon. You can find many such images on the internet which shows climatic zones. And I just wanna point out that along some of these Western boundaries, you have warm, wet climates that extend very far north because of the influence of the warm, wet weather coming along the coast. Certainly along the west coast of North America, that's true. And certainly along the uh, west coast of Europe and even into uh, Scandinavia. So Norway here has a very mild climate considering some of the latitude that exists, that it uh, is situated at, primarily because of the influence of the ocean. Whereas other places, like I pointed out here, Peru, this is not a tropical or coastal rainforest area. It's very dry there because of the trade winds. So if I would ask myself in looking at this plot what climate change might look like uh, in the future, one idea that I might come up with is that there's a gradual slow shifting forward of these climatic zones. So this is not a too uh, a, a outrageous concept. The idea that the planet is warming, maybe we'll gradually shift climate zones further north. And over decades, we might expect the climate that would appear at sort of latitudes here might progress up to the northern parts of the United States and from the United States into Canada and so forth. That's perhaps a simple interpretation of one idea that climate change uh, might contribute. And I bet the words at the bottom there, and I know there's been several questions today about the difference between weather and climate. And just as a sort of a simple phrase to remind ourselves, climate is what you would expect, but weather is what you get. <clears throat> and weather is a consequence of the climate. They are coupled to that. But the weather, for example, is something you would get this week but the climate is something you might determine as what goes in your suitcase. If you are traveling abroad and you wanted to go to Australia or Africa or India, and you were going in a particular month, November or April, you might look at what is the climate like in those months and pack your suitcase accordingly. You don't know what the weather is going to be like, but the climate for that area dictates what you put in your suitcase. Do I need to put in shorts or a rain jacket? And that can be an idea of what is climate. The area you're traveling to has a climate, and this time of year, it typically is rainy or dry, for example, or hot or cold. So that's one way to think about climate. So here's the other quick issue that is, that is really driving what we're talking about today. And this is a, a rather complicated image, but I, what I want to show you is the fact that we have incoming solar radiation, about 350 watts per square meter on average. If we make that into 100% at the top of our atmosphere, then that energy gets redistributed in the upper part of our, uh, our Earth system, the atmosphere and the surface planet of the surface of the Earth. And I just draw your attention down here, only about half of that energy reaches the surface of the Earth. About 35 or 30% gets expelled immediately into outer space by that albedo of light, reflecting off snow, reflecting off clouds. Then the Earth tries to cool off, and it cools off by radiating away infrared radiation. And you can see it's trying to cool off at a significant rate. It's trying to cool off with infrared radiation equal to and in fact exceeding the amount of radiation coming in on average at the top of the atmosphere. But most of that energy does not make it into outer space. It gets absorbed in our atmosphere. A significant fraction gets absorbed by clouds, water vapor, water is a greenhouse gas, 
other greenhouse gases and somewhat by ozone in the atmosphere as well. And then those gases in our atmosphere contain heat and they radiate energy back to our planet. And so here is the greenhouse effect, almost equivalent to the amount of radiation reaching the top of our atmosphere from the sun. In fact, the greenhouse effect in our atmosphere makes our planet 40 degrees warmer on average than it would be otherwise. So our planet is very habitable because of, of greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect isn't a bad thing. It is essential for our climate. But because of that central role, if we start to modify the green greenhouse uh, effect in our atmosphere, it will have and is having a dramatic effect. So that's just a little drawing our attention to what the issue is here. Many of you will be familiar with this. This is an atmospheric measurement of the concentration of CO2 in our atmosphere from the Mauna Loa Observatory on a volcano on the big island in Hawaii. And this was an upset of observations started back in the 19, late 1950s, about 1958. And they picked a place that is very far from all sorts of terrestrial influences and on a dead, a barren a volcano that has almost no vegetation. And we can see that the atmosphere concentration of CO2 has increased from uh, about 315 in 1958 to about 415 now. That's an increase of 35% just in the last 60 years. If we zoom in a little bit, we can actually see the gradual increase of CO2 concentration. This is the anthropogenic contribution. If we plot the monthly curves, we see the northern hemisphere breathing in and out of the biosphere. Every spring, the plants grow, the grasses grow, leaves go on the vegetation, and they draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. And then every fall and winter in the northern hemisphere, the vegetation dies off, the leaves fall to the ground, they biodegrade, and that CO2 is put back in the atmosphere. So this up and down on the monthly scale is showing the northern hemisphere biosphere breathing in and out CO2. It's a living planet. But this increase in CO2 in our atmosphere is changing the greenhouse effect. Here we have from a NASA data set, a global average temperature plot, zeroed in between 1950 and 1980. So it's really relative to 1980. And we see that we're approaching one degree increase since 1980 on a global average. This is taking many, many hundreds of different types of observations from satellite and weather stations all over the planet. You can see there's quite a bit of variability, but nonetheless, the trend is clear. This is a global average of a temperature increase over the last 60 years. We can also divide that up by looking at what's happening on the land and also what's happening in the ocean, something I want to concentrate for the rest of the presentation. We see that since about 1980, the ocean has warmed up just about half a degree on average everywhere. But as I'm about to show you, there are places where the heating has been much more substantial. And certainly the Northeast Pacific is one of those regions. The other thing that's increasing in the ocean, <clears throat> not only is the temperature increasing, but by putting CO2 in the atmosphere, we are putting CO2 in the ocean. And in general, this is a very good thing because it takes CO2 out of the atmosphere where it is a greenhouse gas and buffers it into the ocean. In fact, the ocean has been the major sink for anthropogenic CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. But what also happens when we put CO2 in the ocean is the ocean becomes more acidic. And what is plotted up here are the initiation of some time series just north of Hawaii in the ocean, where this is the dissolved CO2 in the ocean, also following this curve in the atmosphere. But this curve here is pH. This is the ocean becoming more acidic. So as we add CO2 to the atmosphere, we add CO2 to the ocean, and the ocean becomes more acidic. I don't want to help on this, but this is the really the other major CO2 problem the planet faces. Our ocean is becoming very acidic, and I think we will see major changes in the ecosystem as a consequence. So let me jump back. This was the blob. This was identified in the late winter, early spring of 2014, and the oceanographers started looking at their data and seeing this massive amount of heat out in the Northeast Pacific. And the question around the community was, well, where did this warm water come from? And in fact, it didn't really come from anywhere. And I'm going to tell a little story that, in fact, this warm conditions were prevalent throughout the, the year of 2013. And it, it is a result of a lack of cooling rather than an excess amount of heating. So at the time that the uh, warm anomaly or the blob was forming, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans at the Institute of Ocean Sciences conducts an annual survey, or three actually, conducts three times a year. They take a ship and they head out from Victoria here 
out to a station out in the Northeast Pacific called Station Papa. This used to be a weather station before we had satellites, and we can now tell what weather systems are coming. They used to station a weather ship out in the Northeast Pacific here, and it would report in on what the weather was gonna be like coming in the next week or so. And as the ships head out along this line, they conduct temperature profiles through the ocean column. And when they went out in February of 2014, they encountered this phenomenon. And at first they really didn't know what they were seeing. So here we have, this is along Vancouver Island, heading out into the North Pacific to the left here. And along the top is where each of those profiles was taken. So they stopped the ship and they did a temperature profile. And what they've shown here is the temperature anomaly from their climatology that they have in their database. And it shows this very warm layer in the one up, upper 100 meters. At first, they questioned their sensor. They thought their temperature sensor was somehow failing because this was so extraordinary. They couldn't, they've never seen this before. And it was such a large, uh, uh, in magnitude, the two degrees, over two degrees, that they at first questioned their sensor. But when they got back and they tested their sensor, in fact, it was real. So we had to come up with a, an explanation for what caused this warm anomaly in the Northeast Pacific. Here I'm gonna jump back and look at what are the typical conditions which would not result in the warm conditions. The upper panel here is the winter average weather conditions in the atmosphere. And I'd like to draw your attention to the Northeast Pacific here in this low pressure system, which we locally call the Aleutian Low. Here is Alaska and here are the Aleutian Islands. So we can see that this low pressure system sits over the Aleutian uh, Islands and it has a cyclonic circulation circulating around in this pattern. Here we are along the, north, uh, the, the west coast of North America and our storm tracks bring this warm, wet air up to our coast. And in fact, we affectionately call it, oops, let's go, let's see, can I go back? Yeah, right there, it says previous. Oh, previous, sorry, go back. We affectionately call this the Pineapple Express. It brings, Hawaii is down here, but in fact, this, uh, the weather here is moist and it's over a warmer ocean. And so the weather patterns bring storms and clouds and they inundate this west coast of North America with wet conditions throughout October, November into December. And we affectionately call this the Pineapple Express. Generally, this is an atmospheric river. Uh, atmospheric scientists refer to these patterns where we bring up uh, a lot of cloud, a lot of precipitation as an atmosphere. These are the typical conditions in the north. Underneath the Aleutian Low, and I'd like to draw your attention primarily to these two panels on the left. This is, if this is the wind pattern here, then the ocean responds underneath by ejecting warm the surface water out to the sides. This is known as the Ekman uh, transport. And what actually happens is when the wind blows, the surface of the ocean moves to the right as a result of Coriolis. And so as the wind blows in this circular pattern here, these are the wind arrows, the ocean, the surface of the ocean is ejected out of the low pressure system. So generally in the Aleutian low, the warm water is pushed to the boundaries out of the Gulf of Alaska. And in so doing, if we drop to this lower panel, when we push the surface water out of the Aleutian Low, we not only take the warm water that was here and move it out, we allow the deeper, cold, nutrient-rich water to get closer to the surface. And the winds that are blowing here can then mix up cold water into the surface water and mix up nutrients. Those are the typical conditions which happen in the Northeast Pacific. So if we have a temperature profile time series from Station Papa, and the typical conditions in winter are that uh, uh, in summer, so this we've ended the winter, we start with a deep cold profile and through the summer months, April, May, June, and August, we warm the Northeast Pacific Ocean. And it warms from above. And so we have this stratification and we have surface waters in the Gulf of Alaska that are 13, 14, maybe even 15 degrees in temperature. But deep down below, it remains quite cold. In a typical fall season, we progress the other way. Storms come along in the Gulf of Alaska, the winds blow with the Aleutian lows, and gradually the sea surface temperature cools down. We cool it from above and we mix cold water up from below. And by February, we have this deep cold layer in the Northeast Pacific. 
down to around five degrees. Those are the typical conditions. So before Sorry. you go on, Richard. Yes. Just help me as a novice to, yes. to understand uh, these plots, this one and the last one. Those vertical lines are the temperature yes going so, from the surface, surface down to different depths that's right so when we lower an instrument from a ship uh at, let's say a station papa it would measure in the winter typically five degree water all the way down to maybe 140 150 meters depth before it starts even cool down cooler than that wow. and in the summer we add heat at the surface and by August, we end up with a very warm or relatively warm surface layer that maybe is 14 degrees, but deep down in the ocean, it's still quite cold. It's still this four degree water deep down. Those are the typical conditions. Okay, so what we're seeing in this is kind of- The seasonal over, progression. Over the seasons, that, that uh, layer where it's the same temperature gets shallower. That's right. It gets, and it gets shallower. And usually by the winter, we have a deep cold layer. This is not an answer. So I want to draw another, another attention to a community that it woke, uh, was aware of what was happening in the Northeast Pacific before the oceanographers. The Pineapple Express and the Gulf of Alaska and the Aleutian Low has strong winds and the storm patterns cut across the Gulf of Alaska there. And these North Pacific storms have a lot of strong winds. They generate a lot of waves. And when those waves reach the shore, we have surf along the, north, uh, the, the west coast of North America. This picture is taken actually in uh, November 20, uh, 2005 during a surfing competition. The winds are so steady and the surf is up in, in the fall along our coast. They actually have surfing competitions in our, in our fall here. This is from Tofino on the west coast of Vancouver Island. I think this picture shows Peter uh, Devereux actually coming in first place uh, in a surfing competition in 2005 uh, off Tofino on Vancouver Island. And those, that surf is due to the storms that exist off in the Gulf of Alaska. <clears throat> so here I have another cartoon of the Aleutian Low, and this uh, is a composite I've uh, de also developed from the NOAA National Center for Environmental Prediction. And it shows the Aleutian Low here. And what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that that Pineapple Express, if you like, is between the white and the green. It actually flows all along here. But if we just draw the boundary between this green contour and the white contour, here's the typical Pineapple Express bringing our cold, wet weather or our, our wet weather up to the coast of um, North America. And in 2014, this was the Aleutian Low. It was quite weak. There's a large high pressure ridge here. This was actually nicknamed the resilient ridge, the ridiculously resilient ridge by the California and, and uh, Oregon communities because they saw no rain this winter and they were experiencing a massive drought in 2014. But the Pineapple Express now has shifted for this season, not just a little bit north where it usually hits Vancouver Island, but all the way up to Alaska. It's a shift of about a thousand kilometers in a major weather system. The atmospheric river this year shifted a thousand kilometers. It's not a gradual transition of climatic zones creeping up year after year or decade after decade. In one season, the Pineapple Ex Express shifted almost a thousand kilometers. This is a cartoon that represents what was happening in the, the winter of 2014 as well. And we see this high pressure system here it was giving droughts in California. Alaska was getting inundated by the Pineapple Express. They had warm, wet conditions. And in fact, behind the jet stream, the cold Arctic air was plunging down into North America. So they also had a signature of this weather pattern. But what happened with this high pressure system, we didn't have the Aleutian low there. And so we failed to uh, push the wa warm water up to the coasts and we failed to have storms come across. And the people that first were first to point out what was happening there were the surfers. So in the fall of 2013, we had a high pressure system over the Gulf of Alaska. We had a weaker Aleutian low. We had reduced winds. We had fewer cold storms and outbreaks. And we had reduced waves. And along Tofino, there was poor surfing. Here, in fact, is a picture from taken from October, uh, November 2013. It's exactly the same beach, Chesimer Beach 
as we, we had in the previous image. And you can see the surfing there was not uh, happening this year. In fact, the surfing competition in the 2013 had to be canceled. The oceanographers were not aware of what was happening yet, but the surfers knew something was happening. So what actually happened out at Station Papa, we started in the late summer with our typically warm 14, 15 degree water, but the Lucian low winds were weak, the storms were weak, and we failed to cool all the way down. By the end of winter, by March, this is where we ended up. We ended up with a surface layer that's about 100 meters deep, that was about eight degrees, which was three degrees warmer than climatology. And here we have the blob conditions when we plotted up against climatology. Let's go to the next one. So in fact, if I look at the sea surface temperature, this was the blob. Now it's really hard to see the blob out here, but sure enough, if we look at the eight degree contour, it's the boundary between this blue entering into the blue, we see out here in the Gulf of Alaska or in the, the uh, Northeast Pacific, they were mostly eight degree water or, or quite warm water. The climatology is more like this. We have this cooler five, six, seven degree water here in this zone. And if I subtract these two images, one from the other, I get the blob. So the blob is the anomaly. It's the departure from what the sea surface temperature was from climatology. And there we have the blob. It is really quite significant. This is three degrees and it was penetrating down 100 meters. So one of the questions was how significant was this from a departure from climatology? And one of the oceanographers in the region plotted up the standard deviation for the Northeast Pacific. And this was Howard Freeland at the Institute of Ocean Sciences. And this is a plot of the standard deviation, how, how warm it was departing from the mean. And the contours, they're hard to read here, but let me point out this inner contour here is four standard deviations warmer than the climatological mean. Four standard deviations might happen and occur only once in a thousand times, or maybe even longer than that, once every 10,000, so once every thousand years. This was extraordinary uh, in, in its magnitude and it's the amount of heat it represents and it persisted for many years. This is a little bit of a cartoon to show where the anomaly developed. I'm gonna show, I'm gonna step through this. It, it might look a little complicated, but if this blocks represent the, the top of the ocean in the Northeast Pacific, the arrows, and I'll just follow through here, this is the wind. I'm showing the wind blowing on the ocean here. The typical wind might be just plotted as this magnitude. In 2013, the wind was cut by almost a half on average. So I've shown a smaller arrow here by about a half magnitude. It turns out many of the physics associated with interacting of the atmosphere and the ocean goes as the wind stress, which is the wind speed squared. So with a wind speed drop of a half, the wind stress drops by a factor of four. The Ekman transport, that moving of surface water out, is, uh, is a function of the wind stress. So we evacuated the warm water out of the Gulf of Alaska by a factor of four less than previously. And the amount of mixing that comes in from above, so if these storms are cold, we would mix down temperature or heat would come out of the ocean, and mixing goes as a function of the wind speed cubed. So in fact, we may have reduced the amount of mixing by a factor of eight by just dropping the mean winds by a factor of two. The interesting thing is not only are we changing what's happening at the surface of the ocean, we're not exporting warm water out to the coast, we're not importing any cold water from the Aleutian area, and we're not mixing up cold temperatures from below because we've reduced the amount of mixing. And what also happened without uh, mixing up cold water from below we failed to mix up nutrients. And I'll get to that part of the story as well. So not only was the ocean warmer, so it was warmer by about three degrees, we also didn't mix up nutrients from below. And I've just put some not rough numbers here. About 25% of the heating failed to come from cooling from a blow. About 50% or roughly of the heating was the fact that we failed to push the warm water out of the Gulf of Alaska. And about 25% of the lack of cooling came from uh, not mixing cold water up from below. These numbers are all somewhat interdependent. So as you adjust one, you need to adjust the others as well. 
But really, the warm anomaly was a reduction in cooling. So just for the yeah. for people like me who yeah. this don't is know a, the Greek. That's right. <laughs> the, the main point here is that the winds were weaker. The winds were weaker. And, and as a result, we failed to cool the ocean from above and the lack of storms. Yeah. So we failed to cool the ocean from above. We failed to move warm water out of the Gulf of Alaska. That's a sort of a, a, an interesting oceanographic phenomenon, but very important. It pushes the warm water up against the coast. And we failed to mix cold conditions from below. So what actually happened here was a reduction in cooling rather than excess of heating. And if we're looking at a temperature anomaly, we don't know if we failed to cool it or actually added more heat. The anomaly shows us that it's warmer and this is the same consequence. So instead of global warming, it's global uncooling. It's global uncooling, an interesting sort of uh, catchphrase. So let me just summarize the, the, that what we just talked about there, the Northeast Pacific blob, favorable conditions. And that in fact is what we're seeing out there right now. We have reduced winds over the Gulf of Alaska, perhaps in 2013 by a factor of two. We had re reduced equine transport. That's the moving of the ocean water out of the Gulf of Alaska. That was reduced by almost a factor of four because that goes as the wind speed squared. We had reduced cooling from above. The winter storms weren't coming and bringing Arctic air down. So we failed to cool from above and we failed to mix cold water up from below. So a reduction of cooling resulted in a net warming of the Gulf of Alaska. And that is our present understanding of, of what caused the blob. But I wanna now finish up a little bit by looking at some of the other impacts. It wasn't just a temperature impact on the ocean. I mentioned that in addition to not mixing up cold water from below, we failed to mix up nutrients into the upper layer of the ocean. The Northeast Pacific is typically a cool surface layer of water that is high in nutrients. It's a very productive part of the global ocean system. And by failing to bring up nutrients, we really failed to fertilize that upper layer of the ocean. In the Northeast Pacific, we often have, these are diatoms. They're round circular phytoplankton that grow and take in dry carbon. They provide the primary food for the zooplankton. And our zooplankton in the Northeast Pacific are large, round, fat, acid, uh, lipid-rich uh, uh, zooplankton that provide a very rich source of food for all of the fish, the salmon, and the marine mammals in the Northeast Pacific. When we shifted in 2014 as a result of the lack of cooling to much warmer, and what this fancy word here, oligotrophic, which really means it's low in nutrients, conditions in the Gulf of Alaska, what happens is these diatoms did not flourish. Other phytoplankton tended to dominate. And one of the pl plankton that dominated was Pseudonychia, which is long thin strands of phytoplankton. And in fact, it produces a toxin, demoic acid. And this demoic acid feeds up through the food chain and is actually a toxic uh, compound to marine mammals. We would uh, close beaches, for example, if the toxin were to accumulate in mussels and crabs, we would close those fisheries. The other species we saw prevalence of in 2014 and 15 were jellies. And it turns out jellies are also much more prevalent when you have low nutrient conditions. So we saw a major shift in the primary producers of food in the ocean. And this had a dramatic effect on the higher trophic levels. Oh, I'll go back. Great if we can have it. Maybe try the right arrow on the keyboard. Oh, maybe I'll try the right arrow. <clears throat> oh, it does work. That's better. Thank you, Dwight. So the, uh, the higher level, the trophic levels in the Northeast Pacific tended to suffer almost immediately. One of the first uh, parts of the ecosystem that was showing up as dramatically impacted by the lack of nutrients in the Gulf of Alaska, the lack of food in the food web, were some of the bird populations along the north co coast of North America. And in particular, the birds have a limited capacity to survive if they don't eat on a regular basis. And they're very dependent on the food coming from the ocean for their survival. And along the entire coast of North America, within months in early 2014, when the food, the food sources are usually rich and plentiful, they were absent. And large quantities, thousands and thousands of birds in the Northeast Pacific were perishing within months. 
The Alaska cod populations also plummeted during the warm conditions, and there are now many studies examining how, even at the bottom of the ocean, the food chain is affected by the food that filters down through, uh, through the ocean and through the food web and impacts even commercial fisheries. And that toxic uh, domoic acid that is prevalent in some of these low nutrient species uh, accumulates through the food web and eventually gets consumed by the marine mammals. And here's a study, uh, it'll be in the presentation. Here's a study that was uh, quantifying the uh, increase in marine mammal casualties along the coast, primarily of, of North America, of, of United States. But what we saw in 2014 and 2015, consequence of the food being, not, the nutrients not being there in the winter of 2014, the spring blooms didn't happen. The domoic acid was prevalent in the summer of 2014. And by the spring uh, of the summer of 2014 into 2015, the higher trophic levels were receiving high, very high levels of this domoic acid toxin. And we had very high uh, casualties of marine mammals along the coast of North America. So it's not just a weather pattern shift. It's not just a de departure of our uh, uh, pineapple express. By not mixing up nutrients from below, we in fact impacted the ecosystem dramatically. So I wanna close by showing that if, in fact, we're progressing uh, into similar systems uh, this, in 2019. This actually is a figure from late in 2015 or July, 2015. Remember the blob showed up in uh, January, February of 2014. This is 18 months later. We still see very warm conditions in the Gulf of Alaska here. By this time, an El Nino had come along at the equator. We have this classic signature of the El Nino. The El Nino showed up in early 2015 and departed by late 2015, but the blob persisted. The blob showed up in early 2014 and persisted well into 2017. So at that time, I wanted to ask a question about how deep did the blob penetrate? And I want to now show some data from Argo floats. Argo floats are autonomous floats that uh, are out. This is the latest plot. I think I just downloaded this today. This is the number of floats that are out in the middle of the ocean, profiling autonomously and giving us a snapshot of what's happening in the deep ocean. And these floats, they uh, reside at depth, maybe 1,000 to 2,000 meters for about 10 days. And then they get a signal and they turn on and they deep, go a bit deeper and they profile from 2,000 meters up to the surface ocean. And they measure the temperature, the salinity, perhaps even dissolved oxygen and other characteristics of the ocean. And they transmit that data back through satellites. And every day we get, or every day the, the, the system reports back from thousands of Argo floats all over the world. So what I did is I asked the student at Scripps if he could plot up all of the Argo data in this box to see how deep the blob was penetrating. Here we have for reference the line P going out to Station Papa, where we saw that surface signature before. And what he came up with, this is Dylan Amea, from when I, who I met at a workshop in 2017. The Argo floats were deployed in 2014, so he's plotted up all of the Argo data down to 300 meters. And although there was a hint of some warming in 2005, here we have the blob showing up by early 2014, it penetrated down to 100 meters. That's, that's as really as far as it penetrated down in 2014. We didn't get good warming or cooling in the uh, winter of 2014. It persisted through 2015. Again, this is temperature anomaly, anomaly, but we see that the heat is starting to penetrate down below 100 meters. And by 2016, that heat had penetrated down to 250, even 300 meters. There was still some very warm water on the surface by the end of 2016. And it wasn't until 2017 that winter conditions actually finally cooled that surface layer of the ocean. But it has now penetrated down deep into the ocean. Anomalies on the order of one and a half, a half a degree to one degree. Most recently, and I'll just, I, just a comment, I don't have that data. It was just collected this last month. We repeated the transit out, out to Station Papa and in fact, that warm anomaly is now penetrating down about 800 meters into the ocean. So, so just um, to clarify what we're looking at, for, yes. For people who, like me, who aren't familiar with this kind of uh, graph. Yes. So it's going across time. So time is progressing along this direction. And then there's depth is the vertical. And direction. depth is the vertical. And what we've done, because these are a collection of floats, we've taken 
We've taken all the floats that are in this box. It's quite a large area. Mm -hmm. And there may be on the order of a dozen Argo floats in this box at any one time. And they're profiling the ocean every 10 days. And so what the student has done is taken uh, all of that data from the last 15 years and plotted up the temperature and then subtracted the temperature anomaly from each, each month. And this is the resulting time series. It shows that generally the Northeast Pacific, because this is dominating the average, is much cooler, much as half a degree cooler than, uh, than this. Uh, the, when we start averaging in this data, that biases our, our mean up a little bit. But this, this is the warm anomaly, and it's not just the surface, it's now penetrating down. And the punchline I want to say is it's persisted for several years. The heat, even from this uh, lack of cooling, the blob event, is now penetrating deeper into the ocean. It's not disappearing, it's remaining there. And now we're building up a generally a much warmer Northeast Pacific based on even one year of, of major uh, lack of cooling in 2013-14. So when we see that kind of a diagonal, uh, kind of a diagonal pattern of the red. Yes. How it kind of goes down to the right. So this is showing increasing depth as a function of time. So what's happening is this warm anomaly here, this, if you like, it's almost a, it's not so much climate, but it's a major shift in the warming system. This heat is now slowly penetrating its way deeper and deeper into the ocean. It's not just the surface of the ocean phenomenon. It's now penetrating down. And our most recent measurements, I don't have that plot here, uh, from 2019 suggest it's almost penetrating down to 1,000 meters. Wow. So I will close up here. This is, uh, I downloaded this this morning. Uh, I get these plots from a NOAA website, the Earth, Space, and Research Laboratory. Uh, a map page, a map room where I can go and, and, and look at the sea surface temperature, and the sea surface temperature anomaly. And this is the sea surface temperature anomaly on a global scale for the last week. So here we have uh, November 24th to November 30th. And we can see up in the north of the Gulf of Alaska, we are have what I would now call the development of another blob-like condition, a, a Pacific Northeast heat wave that has developed over the last four or five months. And uh, we still have a few months of cooling to happen, December and January. But if this condition persists for the next few months, then I suspect that we have also failed to mix up nutrients. We've got a lot of new heat in the ocean that will continue to penetrate down. We may see the same sort of things happening in the ecosystem, impacts on the ecosystem, if this too represents a lack of mixing of cold water from below. So this is my last slide summarizing. We are seeing rapid changes in the atmosphere and ocean beyond what might be expected from earlier thoughts on climate change, perhaps a gradual heating or a gradual shift of climate zones. We've seen a, two, a one degree shift in temperature down to 1,000 meters over a period of five years, and not a half degree shift in temperature over 30 years. Some of these significant changes could well be associated with changes we're seeing in the Arctic, and I haven't really gone into that, but the Arctic plays a dominant role in determining these meanders in the jet stream, which was such an important part of shifting the Pineapple Express to Alaska, plunging the, uh, the uh, California into a big drought, and even plunging the, the central part of North America into a cold Arctic front. The Northeast Pacific has warmed significantly over the last five years, perhaps as much as half a degree over the top thousand meters. And our climate, uh, this really changes our view of how climate change might show up. It's not going to be a half degree change over several decades. It might be a two or three degree change over even one season. Ecosystems are in fact shifting as well. They have to adjust to these new ocean conditions. And a lot of assessment is going in right now to how the ecosystems have adjusted already since uh, 2014. The studies are continuing because the ocean, the life cycles in the ocean vary from a few years to maybe several or even tens of years. Orca whales, for example, will live 40, 50 years. So the impact of these sort of multi-year phenomenon is yet to be counted on some of the higher trophic levels. Well, we already know that some are impacted rapidly. Species that like warm water take advantage and other species that depend on the uh, food web fat acid, uh, zooplankton, and cooler conditions, their casualties are immediate and, uh, and appear right away. 
So I'm going to finish up there. I think, uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm glad I was able to draw your attention to some of the things that are happening in the Northeast Pacific and some of the signatures that really are perhaps dramatic as far as climate change is concerned. So I'm, uh, I'm here now to, to sort of answer any questions. And Dwight could maybe uh, look down the list and see if we've got any questions, anyone online as well. Yeah, there are uh, a number of questions that come in, Richard, and um, uh, a lot of interest in this. Um, so I'll just um, try and read some of the top ones here. Um, there's a couple of questions here from Soren. Uh, what, what is the main process which leads to the end of a blog? Is, and is that similar or different to the sort of process that you described creating the blog? And um, yes, I think that's an excellent that's an excellent question. Is one we uh, started asking ourselves once uh, the oceanography and the the marine biologists were recognizing that the system had really changed in the Gulf of Alaska. How might it revert back to uh, more typical conditions, conditions that we uh, are more used to over the last 30, 40, even 50 years? which is really a very healthy, productive ocean environment. And uh, we were quite, um, in some sense, we didn't really know. But the idea is, and this is just human nature, if the system reverts back to its prior conditions, the Aleutian Low is large and strong. The Pineapple Express now reverts back to giving rain to Oregon and British Columbia instead of Alaska. If the storm track across the Gulf of Alaska brings strong winds, making strong waves, increasing the surfing in Tofino, for example, but also bringing up nutrients from below, then perhaps the system would revert back to a cold, rich, nutrient-rich upper layer of the ocean in the Northeast Pacific. And that really requires us to go back to sort of a jet stream that has less of a meander and the Pineapple Express and the strong Aleutian Low sitting there over the Gulf of Alaska with strong winds. That did seem to reestablish in 2017 and a little bit in 2018, but by 2019, we are also now seeing a weakened and displaced Aleutian low, similar conditions to what was happening in this, uh, the fall of 2013. So this is a new climate, maybe a climatic norm for us that every few years, we shift into this large meandering mode, high pressure system sitting uh, over the, the Gulf of Alaska, pushing the Pineapple Express, they, in Alaska, there's a huge story in Alaska. Alaska it was experiencing very warm oceans, not only in the Gulf of Alaska, but in the Bering Sea and even in the Beaufort Sea. Alaska has seen, instead of cold, dry snow, they've seen large volumes of wet snow because the Pineapple Express is now hitting them. So uh, there's many large climatic shifts and the, the maybe simple, our simple approach is that if the Aleutian Low comes back, strong storms, then we'll revert back to more normal conditions, or should I say conditions that we characterize as normal, since that's when we started studying these over the last 50 years. Perhaps going back thousands of years, there is a normal that is not what we're familiar with, but certainly for the last 50 years, the Gulf of Alaska has been a cold, nutrient-rich, high productive zone. And that seems to be shifting in the last five years. So good question. Yeah. Um Sort of a, a question. I think I think you've mostly gone over this, but I'll just uh, bring mm -hmm. it up. Is the increase in global temperatures affecting the temperatures of the deep cold layers in the short term, or is it more confined to shallow layers? Is maybe is this uh, penetration into deeper layers in the Northeast Pacific something that's in only in the Northeast Pacific, or is this happening in other places as well? That, th those are both good questions. So I think. Uh, when, I, when I give a class and talk to the students about climate and weather, it's very difficult now to separate those two things out. And we had questions earlier in the day and some other talks about trying to distinguish weather from climate. And again, a simple sort of phrase is climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. But as the climate shifts, you might expect to get new types of weather on a regular basis. And it may be a seasonal pattern that shifts. And so we have become more familiar over the last few decades about understanding a little bit about the impact of El Nino on our weather patterns. When we have a strong El Nino, we might expect our regional weather patterns to change a little bit. 
So we get a drier season or a cooler system, season or a wetter season. And so these major earth systems uh, that get set up, like the blob conditions or El Nino, have dramatic impacts on the weather that we do get. And if they persist, if these new patterns are more dominant than the regular patterns, then our weather systems will change and become the new climatology. So there's a, there's a chicken and egg problem with climate and weather. The weather that we get right now is on top of climate change. So yes, we've had perhaps a global average warming of one degree. That is gradually warm in the ocean. On average, the ocean has warmed up half a degree in the last 40 years. But in fact, in some places like the Northeast Pacific, it looks like it's warmed up half a degree over the last five years on top of that. And that heat is not just confined to the surface ocean. Our latest data is suggesting it's penetrating deep down in the ocean. So that comes back to another sort of early thought experiment. How would climate change show up in the ocean? One simple idea that we had, because we, we, it's hard to look into the crystal ball and see all of these feedback mechanisms. One idea was that the ocean would gradually get warmer at the surface, that would increase stratification, which is how stratified the ocean is by heat and salt, and in fact, reduce the amount of heat that would penetrate into the deep ocean. But in fact, when you have storms as well coming along, that heat is now penetrating down. So it is really having to change our thinking about how the deep ocean might be changing much faster than we had anticipated. So uh, there, there's also a question from Soren, um, about the effect of local upwelling on these kinds of warm events yes. and how they, that may impact the flood-like patterns. So I, I didn't have a chance to go into it, but the, the warm uh, conditions that were in the Gulf of Alaska in 2014 and 2015, the Aleutian Low was set, uh, setting up uh, in the fall of 2015, and it did push the warm water up against our coast. It remained warm uh, in the Gulf of Alaska but it pushed some of that warm conditions up against our coast in what we would refer to as downwelling conditions. And that warm water came along the coast of British Columbia, Oregon, uh, Washington, Oregon, and California. And it stayed there for several years. It raised the temperature of our whole coastal ecosystem by a degree or two. We went into seasonal wind patterns where we had local upwelling and local downwelling. But in fact, the whole surface layer of the ocean was, a, 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 was quite a bit warmer over the last few years. So the, the question comes back to downwelling and upwelling. And upwelling is really important. Upwelling is when the wind patterns cause the surface layer of the ocean to move away from the coast. And when the surface water moves away from the coast, it brings up that cold nutrient water to the surface. And the surface ecosystem is desperately waiting for nutrients to feed the phytoplankton, which then feed the zooplankton, which feed the bait fish and the higher trophic levels, the larger fish in our area, it's salmon, and then even the orca whales. And when we bring those nutrients up, we fertilize the ocean and it becomes a productive ocean. So wind patterns are very important in the ocean for moving that surface layer away or to the coast in downwelling case, moving that surface water away, bringing nutrients to the surface and feeding the entire ecosystem. If these wind patterns change and we don't have a strong upwelling signal as we usually have, then the nutrients won't penetrate to the surface and the ocean will not be as productive as it has been in the past. So that's a good question. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are related and, and we're seeing the, the connection between the atmosphere and the ocean and the ecosystems in the ocean as well and not only uh, is it a big change in the, in the strength of the wind, perhaps in the direction, but we're shifting it significantly. That Pineapple Express, instead of hitting, let's just say Vancouver Island, where I live, it was now hitting Alaska, a thousand kilometers away. It wasn't just a gradual shift over a period of decades. It was one season, it shifted a thousand kilometers. It did come back. We had quite strong rains here in 2017 and 2018. But I'll just comment that it's setting back up to the Pineapple Express is hitting Alaska right now. Victoria, here where we live in, on Vancouver Island, just experienced our wettest, our, our driest November on record. So instead of a Pineapple Express, this is our rainy season. This is, if you like, our monsoon. We get the, the atmospheric river bringing a steady stream of clouds and storms up to our coast. 
It's, it was absent this November. This past November was the driest November on record for Victoria. So upwelling is important, but if we change the wind patterns, you won't get upwelling, you may not get downwelling, and so the ecosystems will be impacted. And the, the species that have no capacity, they don't have blubber reserves, for example, like a large orca might be able to uh, survive a year or two on reserves, but birds have no reserve. Small fish have no reserves. They need food within weeks to a month or they will perish. So the uh, parts of the ecosystem are very susceptible to getting the food within the time frame that they need it. And if the nutrients aren't there, the, the, the ecosystem is depleted in food resources, then certain aspects of the ecosystem will perish right away. Well, um, yeah, there seems to be uh, an issue of um, serious concern. And uh, there's one question that, that echoes that. And uh, we're, we're almost nearing the end of, of, of your time. So maybe I'll, I'll leave you with this final question. And uh, are heat waves, marine heat waves, a major, do you consider them to be a major threat to the oceans? Is this something that we should be paying more attention to? I, I think as, as a science community, I'm certainly an oceanographer on the west coast of North America, we are absolutely paying attention to it. Is it a threat? Um, it's a major change in how our atmosphere ocean is behaving. And at the moment, I don't see it as a threat to, for example, humans, other than the fact that if the ocean resources for food are dramatically impacted, eventually it will impact other parts uh, of, the uh, of the economy, for example, including humans. I don't see the ocean heat waves as having a dramatic impact in the sense that it's, it's not quite like a flooding event, or, but it is associated with large-scale atmospheric disturbances which would result in, for example, major droughts in California, places that desperately need their seasonal rain patterns. If they go a year or two without any rain, then they have high forest fire uh, probability. And we've already seen in the last five, six years, forest fires and fires in California being a huge dramatic problem. And they are related to the weather patterns that give rain to California, and weather patterns that infect the ocean and give, give rise to the blob, and weather patterns that give rise to the Pineapple Express hitting Alaska instead of Northern California. So are the impacts, are, are they related to the blob? The whole system is working together. I don't think you can tease out one component like the blob and say, what's the blob's feedback? It does have some feedback on the atmosphere. A warmer ocean will evaporate more, uh, more moisture into the atmosphere, but the winds that the atmosphere uh, are, are blowing on the ocean is having an equal effect. So it's, they're all jumbled together and it's, it's almost impossible to we'll pull one component out, but they're all related. Yes, the blob is a symptom in some sense at the moment of this large weather pattern that's giving droughts in California Rain, heavy rainfall and snowpack in Alaska, and giving rise to uh, a poor ocean ecosystem. So it's the blob, the heat in the blob is a symptom of a much larger change in, in the weather patterns and systems of the Northeast Pacific. All right, well, uh, thank you so much, Richard, for um, this- Very welcome. This very interesting and sort of <laughs> startling presentation thank you and, yeah uh, it's, it's it's a remarkable set of events and you know uh, several years ago when the blog was happening we sort of were thinking well it's a one-off uh, but maybe it's not maybe it's not and it looks it like we're heading into one now so then um, like you said uh, sudden uh, climate change might not be so gradual when you shift the, that's uh, the pineapple express a thousand kilometers right. north. <laughs> I think that's that's the major takeaway message I want to say is that we may get lulled into a sense that climate change is a one degree shift over many decades, maybe over 50, 60 years, that people will experience a one degree warming. That's a global average. We know the Arctic has already seen four degree warming and the sea ice is diminishing. Some places are not seeing so much. The ocean on average is half a degree, but in the North Pacific, we've seen a half degree increase in the last five years. So 
uh, climate change is not going to show up locally as this gradual warming. It will show up as a major change in your weather patterns, in your rainfall, in uh, uh, excess rain, lack of rain. Um, the, the, the one, one and a half degree temperature shift is a global average that is just a proxy for major changes locally. And I think we should be prepared that climate change is not going to show up in your region or in many places in the planet as a gradual shifting of climatic zones. It's going to show up as a dramatic change in the large scale seasonal weather patterns. Wow, good. All right, well, that's a, a sobering thought and um, gives even more uh, impetus to the negotiators and uh, the scientists and the specialists who are all gathered in Madrid this year to uh, really try to push for accelerated um, action, accelerated or heightened uh, ambition to address this issue and um, create a, a bright and optimis optimistic future for our species and many species that we're connected to here on planet Earth. So we've reached the end of our time for this uh, segment, but there's another one coming up in less than 30 minutes. Um, we will have Lance Kittle, Vicki Nicholas Goldstein, Joni Klepas, and Wallace Nichols. And they'll be talking about ocean as a solution to climate change and how we do it from the inland. So that's a curious topic and I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> so I hope um, many people who are watching will have a chance to tune in uh, within less than half an hour for the next segment in this 24 hour around the world virtual blue cop 25. Thanks to everyone who was able to tune in and um, we hope to see you sometime in the future. Let's do this again.